Okay, good morning, everybody. Let's try again. Good morning. Yeah, that's better. Um, it's good to see you all this morning. Welcome to Gorsill Baptist Church. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Matt, um, and I'll be leading worship with these guys this morning. And it's our privilege to welcome Martin and Glenn Smith um, from Bratton Baptist Church down in Westbury. Uh, Martin will be sharing with us in a little while. And we'll be able to, uh, there'll be an opportunity as well to find out a little bit more about Martin and what he's been up to uh, in a few moments. Before we start singing, let's just, uh, just be still. Um, I don't know what your morning has been like. It might be nice and relaxed, or it might be the complete opposite of relaxed. Um, possibly depending on if you've got children in the house. Um, but let's just spend a moment now just in quiet and just kind of bring our hearts and our minds before God. Father God, we come before you this morning, um, a new day, another week at church, and Lord, we just pray that we don't come with a sense of uh, duty and routine, but we come with a sense of expectancy to meet with you. Father, we thank you that we have the opportunity to meet together, and Father, we just pray this morning that the, the songs that we sing, the words that we hear, and the prayers that we offer can all be glorifying to you, and that you can reveal yourself to each of us in just the way that we need. And Lord, we, are, we just say that we are here for you, that we give ourselves to you this morning. Lord, help us to leave any distractions at the door um, and just focus our hearts and our minds on you today. Amen. Okay, I'm just going to invite you to stand if you're able to. And um, we do have a box of instruments down on the front, so if you want to make a joyful noise, uh, do feel free, young and old, to come down and grab something. Um, and we're going to spend a, f a few moments now in praise and worship to our God.
gathered here together as your people with the aim of praising you, with the aim of lifting your name high. Father, we thank you for who you are and for all you have done and continue to do for each of us. Lord, you are almighty, you are sovereign, and you alone are worthy to be praised. Amen. I realized partway through that song that I think there are a whole load of actions, so consider yourselves lucky. (laughs) I'll have to remember for next time. Um, okay, we've got one more song um, before we're going to hear a bit from uh, Martin. Um, kids, shine from the inside out. Hands up if you know it. Let's try it with adults. Adults, shine if from the inside out. Lovely. So let's make this a joyful noise. This is all about the fact that this is a God that we don't want to keep for ourselves. We want to shine <laughs> from the inside out to all those around us so that we do stand out and make a difference to those uh, we know.
everybody. Right, do take a seat. Okay, I'd just like to invite Martin to come on up. Hi, Martin. Hi, Matt. Right. Um, so, everybody, this is Martin. Martin, this is everybody. Morning, everybody. Oh, they're good, aren't they? <laughs> um, so, I just thought it would be a good opportunity just to um, get a few moments to get to know who Martin is, what he's been up to. Um, so, Martin, I understand you're a retired Baptist minister. That's right. So, yes. presumably, that means feet up on the table, reading the paper, <laughs> generally, generally relaxing. Is that, is that well, right? That's what I thought when I retired, but it didn't work out quite like that. No, I... Uh, I have a fairly busy schedule of activities. I preach quite a lot. I'm still involved in a number of uh, BU and association committees and things. Uh, Glenn and I both drive for, for Westbury Link, which is taking folk to hospital and doctor's appointments and so on. Uh, we have uh, five grandchildren, which take up, well, certainly the three younger ones take up a fair bit of time. Sounds like a, a busy lifestyle. Indeed, right? yes. <laughs> so, so imagine a day where you've got nothing that you have to do. There's no requirement upon you. What would you do on that day? Well, if it was a nice sunny day, I'd possibly go down sailing in Pool Harbour. Sailing, very nice. Yeah. Mm. Would that be with, with Glenn? Or? No, no, she's not very keen on... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I have a friend at Bratton who uh, was my regular crew. Oh, sounds, sounds good. I think there are a few avid sailors amongst us, um, so I'm sure that will go down well. Um, one that I'm sure the children will be interested in this answer, it's a very important question. Sweets or chocolate? <laughs> what, what do you reckon, kids? Sweets or chocolate? Sweets! <laughs> Make a mixed bag there. Uh, what, what yes, I think I'd have a mixed bag, actually. Oh, no. I <laughs> very, very diplomatic, very diplomatic. I like it. Very good. So... So whereabouts are you now then? Down in Westbury? We live in Westbury. We uh, worship, uh, we're members at Bratton, which is a little village about two miles down the road. Yeah. Excellent. Um, and last question. Um, what will you be sharing with us um, briefly later on? Sorry, briefly now, not necessarily briefly later. <laughs> I just want you to go away with the idea that uh, whatever you uh, experience in life, whatever sort of person you are, however old you are, uh, whatever your views on things are, God loves you just the same. That sounds excellent. We shall look forward to that. Um, thank you very much. You're welcome. We'll hear, hear <laughs> more from Martin a little bit later. Um, okay, time for some notices. Sorry, my voice is a bit rubbish today, but hey. Um, so, I understand that Brian Mildenhall has um, safely landed in Nepal. Um, so, Mark, how long is he out there for? Six weeks. So it would be good just to continue to pray for Brian and the team out there as they're working with the orphanage. If you want any further details on that, um, do speak to Mark. I think Mark had an update from Brian, so he'll be able to share um, all of that as well. Um, a few things this week. On Wednesday, we've got an open worship um, kind of time on Wednesday night at 
So if you're part of the team, come along. If you're not part of the team but want to explore what that might look like or just want to gather together for a bit of worship, then I really do encourage you to come along as well. Um, it's a complete open door, open invite. And then also there's something exciting. Now I'm looking for Mari. I don't know whether you want to say anything about the iCafe because that's starting this week. Yeah, come yeah. So, uh, yes, um, our ICAF, International Cafe, starting this week on uh, Thursday. So we're really looking forward to welcoming people from all sorts of other nations to come and learn our language and hopefully to share a bit about our faith at the end. So please be praying for that. It is an outreach, not just a teaching thing. Um, fantastic opportunity. And if you would like to be involved, please speak to me. Thank you. Lucky lot. Uh, just to say that we send out the weekly by email. If uh, you would like to receive the, the weekly and get uh, regular updates on what's happening in the church, then uh, do let us know. We do need people to sign up to, to email lists these days, otherwise we get into trouble. Um, but that weekly does go out to everyone. If you've asked for it and you've not receiving it, then be assured it's being sent to you and do check your spam folders or, or your junk mail folders because what we're finding is a lot of, um, host of ISPs that you use to connect to the internet are telling, telling your email clients that our, our newsletters are spam or junk. You need to move it out of that folder and tell the system it's not junk. Okay? On occasions, uh, the email doesn't even get that far. There's nothing I can do about it. I'm looking for alternative ways of getting email to you. Uh, just complain to your ISP because it should be coming through. Thank you. Thank you, Lars. Um, yeah, just encourage you, if you do have the weekly, do check it out. There's a lot of information in there, um, things to pray for, people to pray for. So, yeah, do take a look at that. Don't just dismiss it. And if you don't have it, I think there are some copies at the door uh, that Nick just very kindly waved in my face. Um, so you do grab a, a hard copy if you need to. Um, just one final announcement. I'm led to believe that Tuesday is a significant day for a couple of people in the church. Um, Steph Gibson and Mikey Gibson, I believe you both have, well, Mikey's not here, but they're both significant birthdays. Um, I can't tell you the source of my information. That would be a bit unfair. Um, but Mikey, I believe, is turning 21, and on the same day, Steph is also turning a number. Um, so it'd be good just to acknowledge that and shall we sing happy birthday we're going to do it completely a cappella because I have no idea how to play it on guitar um, so let's sing happy birthday happy birthday Brilliant, very good. We hope you have a great day, Steph. Huh? Oh, and it's Mikey's birthday tomorrow. But I don't think we'll sing happy birthday. That, that might go a little bit pear-shaped. Um, so, um, I just, yeah, those who are taking the offering, now is the time to take up a collection. Um, kids, we've got the pig down here, so if you want to put any money in there for your collection, then that would be great.
Okay, let's just pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you um, for your provision. Father, we thank you for the gifts that we have uh, given today through these bags or through our accounts. Uh, Father God, we just pray that um, as a church you give us the wisdom um, to discern how you want us to spend these gifts. Lord, help us to be wise in what we do. Help us to be seeking you in what we do. Um, and we thank you that you are a God that takes what we have and makes things happen beyond our wildest dreams. So, Father, we just pray your blessings upon these gifts. And, Lord, we pray, too, for our, our young people and children as they go to their groups. Father, we just pray that you can really uh, bless them in this time, help them to have fun, help them to just discover something new about you and what it means to be a friend of Jesus. Uh, we pray for the teachers and helpers, Lord, just give them your words um, to say to the kids this morning. Amen. Okay, kids, out you go. Have a great time. Okay, we're going to continue in our worship now with um, some song worship, um, and some of these songs, they might be new, they might be old, um, but it's the words that matter. It's not just a song, it's words that we are speaking and singing to God um, from our heart. So I just encourage you to um, yeah, respond as you need to, whether that's singing, whether that's just listening to the words, um, whether that's standing or sitting. This is um, just a free time uh, to worship as, as we need to in spirit and in truth.
Let's just offer up our prayers to God now, either in our hearts or sharing out loud. Just spend a moment now.
thank you that you are a faithful God. And as we've sung, Lord, we just want to say that we love you today. Lord, we love you for who you are and for what you do. And so, Father, we are so sorry for the times where we lose sight of who you are, where we put other things in your place. Lord, forgive us. And this morning, help us just to be reminded once again of your amazing, amazing love for each of us. Amen. Do you take a seat. So um, before Martin comes to speak to us, I've got our Bible reading for today, which is Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 to 16, and it's Jesus telling the parable of the workers paid equally. So the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into the vineyard. About the third hour he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did the same thing. Why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to the foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about the eleventh hour came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to, to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, friend, I'm not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. So Martin, if you want to come up and I'll just pray with you for a second. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for Martin, and we just pray, Lord Jesus, that all the work and all the stuff that he's put in and studied this week, that you will bless him this morning, that you'll bless us, that it will be his words, or your words coming through his mouth, and we just pray, Lord Jesus, that there'll be a challenge and encouragement for each and every one of us, 
And we just pray too that Martin will really feel a touching of your Holy Spirit as he speaks to us this morning and then he'll go away knowing that he too has been blessed by you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much. When I sat down, Glenn told me off because I didn't tell you half the things that we do. <laughs> and she said, you didn't mention church. Well, we members at Bratton, I preach, she plays the keyboard and uh, leads worship. We're on the, um, the welcomers rota, the coffee rota, the church cleaning rota. Um, we belong to a home group. We help with the soup run for the homeless in Trowbridge. Oh, and we're involved in the children's work as well. So that's just to encourage you that if you've got a spare minute, I'm sure the church can always find a job for you to do. <coughs> now, <coughs> I want you to imagine this morning that you live in a country which is going through a severe financial downturn. Okay? I know it's stretching it, but, but try uh, the country is ruled, governed by a, a small group of people who are independently wealthy. Their fiscal policy seems to be to make sure that those who've got wealth keep it and the tax burden is put on those who have very little. Uh, because of the uh, policy they have, the uh, interest rates are rising, so the cost of living is going up. It doesn't affect those who are wealthy but it's a real struggle for those who are on low pay or even no pay. And it's, it's a recipe for disaster, only they can't see it. Now, you will all know that the country I'm talking about is the United States in the late 1930s, just to make clear. And uh, it's that situation into which President Roosevelt said uh, he was introducing what they called a fair labor bill. He said, America should be able to devise ways and means of ensuring to all our able-bodied working men and women a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. A fair day's pay for a fair day's work. And that's been the objective of the labor movement, of the trade unions and other workers' groups uh, down through the years to uh, increase pay and to adopt reasonable working conditions and hours. And, of course, we all agree, don't we, that those who are uh, contributing in any way whatsoever should be paid in a fair and just way. It's strange then, isn't it, that Jesus appeared to think differently. Where should I be pointing this? Because it doesn't seem to be doing anything. Not to worry, I'll carry on, it'll come up in a minute. <clears throat> what we're going to be looking at, of course, is the, the scripture passage you heard just now, of the uh, parable of the workers in the vineyard. <clears throat> Jesus is talking ab about those work. There we are. And uh, he's saying or describing that in this parable, what he's actually talking about is the kingdom of God. What the kingdom of God is like. He uses many parables and sayings, of course, to express that. And uh, the gist of it is that the kingdom of heaven is where... God's, what matters to God, matters to everyone else. Where right and wrong are determined by God on God's terms. So, in our parable, there's a landowner. Clearly a person of some influence. It's early in the morning, very early in the morning, and it's his usual habit to go out and hire workers. These are casual workers who hang around in the marketplace and sends them out to work in his vineyard. He offers each of them a denarius, which they agree to, and then he sends them out to work. Now, a denarius is a, a decent day's wage. Nowadays, it's the equivalent of about 120 pounds. Well, it's not a fortune, but uh, 
if you earned £120 in a day, you probably wouldn't be too disheartened. So they've agreed to work for that amount for that day. Then you remember a couple of hours later, about nine o'clock in the morning, the same landowner goes out and he sees other chaps standing around doing nothing. So he tells them, or invites them, to also go out and work in the vineyard. And he says, I'll pay you whatever is right. So they went and joined the other workers. Then about three hours later, about lunchtime, noon, then again at three o'clock in the afternoon, he did the same thing. And all the workers agreed to work for the landowner, trusting him that he would pay them whatever is right. Now, we get a sense that the landowner is known. He's a, a big wheel in, in, in the village. He's trusted. You know, he's a man of integrity and honour. And people are happy to work for him, even if he doesn't tell them how much he's going to pay them. They know he'll see them right. So they all agree to go and, and work in the vineyard. Then he goes out again at five o'clock and think in, in Palestine at five o'clock, it's just beginning uh, to get dusk. An hour later, it's going to be dark. And so he says to them, why have you been standing here all day long? Because there they have been since early in the morning and it's now the day is almost over and they're still there. And they say to him, because nobody's hired us. So he says, all right, go and work in my vineyard. I'll pay you what's, what's fair. So off they go. Okay, so far, no problem. A normal day, there's work that needs to be done. There are workers who are ready to go and work for a proper wage, and then there's the work day. And there's nothing special about it. But the story continues. When evening came the uh, owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers in and pay them their wages. Beginning, he says, with the ones I hired last and then the ones I hired first. So the ones who were hired last came and received a denarius. And when those who came who he'd hired first, expecting to receive more, were also paid a denarius. When they received it, Scripture tells us they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said. And you've made them equal to us who've borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. So even in that brief text of Scripture, you can begin to feel the tension, can't you? Uh, there's a, an unrest, a sense of unfairness and injustice. So what, what's the affront? What, what is the offence? Well, those who worked for 12 hours were paid the same as those who'd only worked for one hour. And you can understand the sense of injustice. I've, I've been working hard all day, out in the hot sun, sweating and labouring, and these guys here hardly worked long enough to, to break into a sweat. I deserve more than them. I've done more than them. You've made me equal with them, but we're not equal. I think there should be a distinction. I'm better than them. I've done more. I've given more of myself. Me and them, we're, we're not equal. I'm speaking up for my rights. <laughs> How does the landowner respond? Is he fair in his response? He says to them, probably the one who's doing the most complaining. I'm not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. If I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you, don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Now, to be honest, if I put myself in the shoes of that chap who's been working hard all day in the heat of the sun uh, and who's been complaining, I I'm kind of stuck. Well, yes, I did agree totally to pay to work for that amount of money. It's, it's actually a fair day's wage for a, a fair day's work. It's nothing to sneeze at. 
Okay, it was a, a contract I agreed to. The landowner's not ripping me off. He's given me exactly what I wanted. But still, come on. And Jesus finishes his parable. Or are you envious because I am generous, says the landowner. And again, putting myself in that chap's shoes, that's exactly what's happening here. I am envious. But then, come on, don't I have a right to be envious? The landowner is suggesting that what's really in the heart of the person complaining is that this isn't a matter of justice, but of generosity. It's not a matter of justice because he's not being unjust, but he is being generous. And see, the issue here, the, the problem, the, the dilemma, is that the landowner hasn't done anything wrong. He's acted with integrity and fairness. He's paid the way he said he would pay, but he's done more. If he's offended against anything, it's the idea that we only get what we earn. And that's a powerful idea because it's so simple and it's the way the world works. If I say I'll work for you for £10 an hour and I put in £8, I put in eight hours, you give me £80, everybody's happy. That's the way it, it happens. After you've taken off national insurance and income tax and all, all the rest. But then the landowner asks a rhetorical question. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money. And he could have gone on to say, look, chaps, stop and think for a moment. These other chaps have been patiently waiting in line all day long for someone to come and hire them. You were just fortunate to have been chosen first. But these people, they, they have the same responsibilities as you. They have to feed their families. They have to put a roof over their heads. They have... Uh, elderly parents to look after. Tomorrow, the shoe might be on the other foot. They might get hired first, and you might be at the end of the queue. How would you feel then? Should you not be rejoicing with them that their needs are being met as well as yours? I'm in the fortunate position, he says, of being able to be generous with my money. Let me give it as I choose. So it is that this is a parable of the kingdom of God. The question shows that God's great gifts, simply because they are God's, are distributed not because they're earned, but because God is gracious. In the kingdom of God, the driving force is not merit or ability. It's grace. God's love undeserved poured out upon each one of us. Unmerited favour. But that's a principle of the kingdom of God. The blessings of God are not earned. The good things in our lives, the joys in our lives, the, the spiritual blessings we receive, these are not earned. Even salvation itself, the saving of our souls, is not earned by us. I mean, do you suspect, might not admit it, but suspect even a little bit that by being good, you're somehow putting God in your debt? You know, you look at the person over the road who's a right rogue, and then you think of your own life, and you think, actually, God, you know, you must love me a little bit more than you love him, surely. Maybe we can earn our way to heaven just a little bit by the way we live our lives. Well, if you do suspect that, I've got some good news for you. But first, of all, I've got some bad news. And the bad news is there is absolutely nothing you can do to put yourself in God's debt, to make God owe you something. There's absolutely nothing you can do to earn salvation, eternity in heaven with God. How do I know that? Well, the source for all Christian knowledge, of course, is the Bible. When Paul wrote to the Christians in Rome in chapter 3, he said, 
all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's you and me. And actually, I suppose, if we're honest, it it doesn't take much to understand that, does it? We look back over our lives and we can think of numerous occasions when we failed God. If we have any idea who God is, how wonderful, how beautiful, how holy, how righteous, how flawless, how perfect he is, we're not going to think that in our own merits we can ever stand in his presence and look up into his face. To be in his presence is to enjoy his goodness and grace now and for all eternity. And none of us deserves it. That's the bad news. But the good news immediately follows. The next verse in Romans 3 says, All are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. All are justified freely. See, we can't fix ourselves. We can't earn our way to heaven. Somebody has to do that for us. Someone has to reclaim my life from darkness. Someone has to reclaim my life from despair, my life from hell. Someone has to reclaim, someone has to redeem. Someone has to do it. But who is there? Psalm 49, it says this, No one can redeem the life of another or give to God a ransom for them. The ransom for a life is costly. No payment is ever enough so that they should live on forever and not see decay. That's right. The ransom for a life is costly. No amount of anything is ever enough. That's very true. But then, of course, Psalm 49 was written long before Jesus. The Jesus who came to live and to die, to give his life for your sins and mine. Before Jesus came to ransom our lives, to pay that incredibly high price, which was the cost of his own precious life. His own blood poured out for you and me. Who could possibly redeem the life of another or pay the ransom? Well, God, in the person of Jesus, can and did. And so, while the world in which we live is a wage-based world, where you and I are paid what we earn, if we're lucky, the kingdom of God is completely different. The kingdom of God is a, God of gen- uh, uh, a kingdom of generosity. C.H. Spurgeon, that great Victorian Baptist preacher, tells the story in his book, All of Grace, of a man who visited a woman who he knew was in great financial need. He came with a, a generous gift to help her with her expenses. He knocked at the door. She heard the knock and panicked and hid so nobody would know she was in. The next week he met her and told her about his visit. And she said, yes, I heard you knock. I didn't realise it was you. I thought it was the landlord come for his rent and I didn't have it to pay. Let that sink in for a moment. The man came desiring to give, but she mistook him for someone coming to take. So often God is mistaken as being a person who exacts payment from people. And the fact is, he's the one who's giving the gifts. So many people of all kinds of religions in the world today are geared to think, this is what you have to do to please God. In Christianity, that's turned around. Our message is, here is what God has done for you. He'd like you to please him in return. Yes, of course he would. But he does it anyway. Why? Because he loves you. Because he's a God of grace. The kingdom of God is God's realm of authority 
where he exercises his power in kindness and love. And all that's true. And all that's available to us. For how much? For free. When we believe that Jesus died for our sin and we turn and follow him. Your salvation, my salvation, cost Jesus everything. That means he gave his everything for you. It means that because he considered your life to be worth the daying, laying down of his own life, he willingly went to the cross. And there you have it. God's grace. God's free gift. It's yours for the asking. If you haven't already, then this morning, you have the opportunity to ask God to come into your life in a new and fresh way and to bring his love and his peace and his joy. You accept his sacrifice for your sin. You repent, which means to change your direction and turn to him. And when you do that from the heart, then God will accept you. He'll be standing there like the father of the prodigal son, running towards you with arms open wide, waiting to receive you into his love. Now that's whether you've been a Christian since the age of 10 and you're now knocking on 80 or even more. The evening is growing closer and you've been in the fields all day. Or it may be that you're actually knocking on 80 now and you've only been in the field for the last hour. You've only known Jesus for a short while and you haven't yet come to that point of commitment. If you decide to follow Jesus now, the result is actually exactly the same. If you received Jesus when you were 10 or whether you were 80, God in his generosity will welcome you into his kingdom. Why? How? Because the price has been paid. God doesn't owe you anything. God does love you more than anything. And he wants you to feel that love this morning. Let's spend a moment in quietness. Let that thought soak in. Lord Jesus, we may have been looking at things totally wrong. We may have been serving you all our lives. Or we may have only been thinking about becoming a Christian for the last couple of weeks. What we need to understand, Lord, is that you love us all equally. And you pour out your grace with generosity. So that there is no one who is outside the compass of your love. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon each one of us this morning. Help us to accept that grace for ourselves. And to share the knowledge of your love with others that day by day your kingdom may grow and your love be spread. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Saviour. Amen. Thank you, Martin. We're going to draw our time together to a close now um, by singing a modern version of a great old hymn, Amazing Grace, and with those words from Martin in our minds, kind of, that amazing grace that God has shown us. So I invite you, if you're able to, let's stand and we'll sing.
Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that this next week just share some words from Romans 8 so what does this all mean if God has determined to stand with us tell me who then could ever stand against us for God has proved his love by giving us his greatest treasure the gift of his son and since God freely offered him up as a sacrifice for us all he certainly won't withhold us withhold from us anything else he has to give Heavenly Father, we pray that as we move into this next week, you already know what each of us are going to face, what each of us are going to have to deal with. But as those words reassure us, Lord, you are there with us and with you by our side, 
nothing is better, nothing is greater. So Lord, just help us to remember that, that you are with us, you are for us. And so who can possibly be against us? Let's just share the grace with one another. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. Do take some time to stay behind afterwards for a cup of tea or coffee or biscuit through in the hall.